at one o'clock and we have a very exciting community meeting. I will get us going. Hello and welcome to the April YVSC community meeting. I'm Michelle Stewart, the executive director of the Yampa Valley Sustainability Council, and it's a pleasure to have so many of you joining us for this great discussion today. As many of you know, YVSC was established as a nonprofit in 2009, and we are guided by the mission to serve as a leader, resource, and catalyst for building a sustainable and resilient Yampa Valley region. These monthly community meetings are designed to convene community partners and members so that we can connect, discuss relevant community initiatives, identify common goals and challenges, and find ways to collaborate to create more impactful and farther reaching programs and practices in our community. For this month's community meeting, we have the great pleasure of having Carolina Manriquez, Colorado State Forest Service Forester, joining us to speak about the state of the forest and provide a preview into the wildfire conference that's coming up at the end of this month. With unprecedented drought conditions creating a new baseline for how we know and manage our forests, the timing of Carolina's talk couldn't be better. Following Carolina's talk, we will move into a roundtable discussion and Q&A, where I will cue in a few partner organizations and entities who will share perspectives relating to their work in forest health and stewardship, and then I'll open up the floor to questions and comments. This is a great opportunity to ask an incredibly knowledgeable forester about forest health and the upcoming wildfire conference, so we look forward to a lively discussion today following her talk. Uh, please note that the chat menu at the side of your screen will be saved and distributed to all meeting attendees, so please also use this as a place to share resources with one another. If you have a question that you would like to pose, you can either put it into the chat and I can cue you in, or feel free to raise your hand during the meeting uh, to ask your question live. Last, please remember to keep your microphone on mute when you are not talking. So at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Carolina Manriquez, Forester at Colorado State Forest Service. Uh, for those that might not be familiar with what Colorado State Forest Service is, it is a service and outreach agency of the Warner College of Natural Resources at Colorado State University, and it is guided by the mission to achieve stewardship of Colorado's diverse forest environments for the benefit of present and future generations. Carolina, as many of us have the fortune of knowing, is a brilliant ambassador of the mission and work of Colorado State Forest Service. In her role as a forester at Colorado State Forest Service, a position she has held for over 10 years, Carolina has educated, convened, and supported thousands of landowners in actively managing their forests in order to increase forest health and reduce the risk of massive, high-intensity, long-duration wildfires. Fire mitigation work that was initiated in Sanctuary Neighborhood in 2021, which illustrates the kinds of fire mitigation work Carolina and her team lead and support at Colorado State Forest Service. The fire mitigation work in Sanctuary Neighborhood began due to the recognition that Sanctuary Neighborhood is situated adjacent to a key area of potential fire danger on the east side of Steamboat Springs. The sanctuary is located within the wildland urban interface in the Fish Creek watershed which, as we know, is a vital source of water supply in Steamboat Springs. And Sanctuary homeowners funded a two-year, $300,000 project to address nearly 100 acres of fire fuels, which were comprised of tree falls, ground fuels, beetle-killed trees, and a tree blowdown from storms in 2020. Many other landowners and HOAs continue to reach out to Colorado State Forest Service for related forest management support, including other neighborhood groups like Dakota Ridge, Stagecoach, Catamount, and Near Pearl Lake up in North Route. Another important component of Carolina's work as our local Colorado State Forest Service forester is her leadership and impact in supporting reforestation projects. Carolina is one of the celebrated founders of our long-standing community reforestation project known as Retree, and since it was started over 12 years ago, Carolina Um, I think we lost Michelle. Can you can you guys still hear me? Okay. Um, and I'm the host now. I think she's just. Um, she's back on, Kate. Okay. You're muted, Michelle. Though. Now, I'm mute. now I'm back. <laughs> I went into a, a white room in our virtual world. Okay. <laughs> 
Sorry, apparently I have the unstable internet. Okay, so um, going back to Nona's Retreat, since it was started over 12 years ago, Carolina has educated and helped our community plant over 14,000 trees. Each year, Carolina helps train a team of planting leaders, teaching them how to plant a tree so that it will survive, and her support and expertise has been essential to the success of the projects each year. She has helped design the planting sites, carrying her foresters tape around, and she's been helping our YBSC team read the landscape so we can see where to plant trees. And on the days of planting, Carolina is out on the ground teaching volunteers of all ages how to successfully rebuild our forests one tree at a time. Carolina has also been a vital stabilizer to Colorado State Forest Service Nursery, which grows our trees from the cuttings we send to the nursery each year. She also serves as secretary to the Route County Wildfire Mitigation Council, a role that she brings great value to given her expertise and experience advancing collaborative forestry projects that increase forest health and reduce the risk of wildfire. Carolina holds two master's degrees, one in silviculture and restoration ecology, and one in integrated resource management. She brings over two decades of experience working in forest management and conservation on three continent, continents, each time convening and leading a diverse array of partners, building capacity for the conservation and re restoration of diverse ecosystems, and stepping forward as an inspiring leader focused on improving local and global environmental sustainability. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I'm off again. Oh no, <laughs> I thought I was off again. I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carolina, for joining us today. It is such a sincere pleasure to host you. And at this point, I will turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. I'm going to have to use you as my official PR lady because I sent her like a four line bio and that was like, wow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to get that from you. <laughs> <laughs> to use now on my own. It is a pleasure to be here. And I am looking forward to uh, telling you about our current forest health conditions. I'm sure you know what's going on because you are out and about as I am. But we're going to go into a little more detail. And then obviously, it, open it up for questions at the end. So with that, I'm going to share my screen in just go over a quick presentation with you. Uh, how is that? Can everyone see the cover, the 2021 report of forest health? Um, yes? Okay, we're good. So um, yeah, I guess I don't have a lot to add to what Michelle said. Um, but I am Carolina with the State Forest Service. We have an office on the west side of town and, uh, and we're here to serve you, right? We're the Colorado State Forest Service. So we're here to serve our community and protect our forests. Um, today, we're gonna talk about the report um, of the, on the health of Colorado's forests. This report is um, published by us every year based on aerial data surveys that we make and also you know interactions with the field to understand how our forests are changing and what we're doing um, to make sure that we uh, abide by our mission to be the stewards of, of our Colorado's forests. Um, the the way the the report the report is really broad at the beginning kind of tackling statewide issues and then it goes into uh sections so we're divided in quadrants like a lot of agencies in Colorado and so you will find information um in in four regional subsections and then that's where you find more pertinent local information and so what does that look like for us today um, some of the main um, forest health issues we're seeing beyond the spruce beetle that we have been seeing for a while is a little bit of increase in, in Douglas fir beetle activity in the Northwest. We're seeing about 3,000 acres of, of, um, of spread of the Doug fir beetle. Again, these are native beetles that are endemic to our systems and that are eating some of that older component of the landscape. Uh, we're seeing this throughout, you know, Route County and Eagle County, Garfield Summit, 
a little bit in Pitkin and Mesa counties. And some of you might be aware of some of the work we were doing around the House and Hill uh, ski area. That little stand above the jumps, that's all Douglas fir. It's an island remnant of Doug fir. And we've been doing a lot of work with the city through the years to try to keep that stand alive using pheromones and using you know selective removal treatments and so if you are aware that you have douglas fir on your property and you're starting to see some action or some decline some trees turning red get in touch with us we're trying to avoid the spread and contain it in as much as possible we're also seeing uh, the pinion ips uh, grow exponentially. I mean, the drought is obviously affecting um, the, you know, stressing our trees. Um, this, you know, pinion is more towards the west, right? So it'd be Moffat County and then around Mesa County, um, the Gateway Canyon areas around Mesa County. And, and, and the bummer is that pinions don't really have, uh, I mean, obviously they're critical for habitat and other issues, but we don't have tons of markets for it. So it's a little harder to treat and, and it's spreading really, really, really rapidly. Uh, the other issue we are seeing really prevalent on our landscape is the Western balsam bark beetle. We have about 22,000 acres affected by it across our higher elevations in Colorado. So you've probably seen some subalpine fir turn red, you know, on Emerald Mountain, on Rabbit Ears, up in North Route. Um, again, this is a native beetle um, in, in it's causing a decline in all subalpine fir in and there isn't a lot you can do about it either. I mean, you can remove those trees, try to, um, again, stop the spread of, of the beetle. This is usually uh, comes together with um, a root disease, our malaria root disease. So it's, uh, it's happening. It, we need to be aware of it. Again, if you see a lot of decline happening around an area that you're familiar with, let us know so that we can make sure to track that. Um, our, our 2021 report is on our website. I also have some hard copies here in my office. So if you're interested in seeing it in more detail, please come by or reach out and I can send you the PDF or mail you a hard copy. Um, so as, as Michelle was saying, um, you know, the, our, the State Forest Service has been around since the mid 1950s. And we are here to serve, to serve you, right? To serve our, to serve our communities um, with forestry assistance, wildfire mitigation expertise, and outreach and education. Um, our headquarters are in Fort Collins, and um, our mission is here. Our mission is to achieve the stewardship of Colorado's diverse forest environments for the benefit of present and future generations. So we need to be proactive and adapting as we're seeing you know, climate change affecting our ecosystems and responding accordingly. Um, beyond, beyond the outreach and education, we also do um, what I was mentioning, you know, insect and disease detection so that we can get ahead of what's happening. Um, we do a lot of forest monitoring, inventory and data. We have a seedling tree nursery, and we also do urban and community forestry assistance. So we work with the city, we work with Hayden. Um, we are in charge of, again, supporting everyone so our natural forests and also our landscaped urban forests um oops so you know the csfs works with partners across the state to do this work we can't do this alone like in anything else that we do that's natural resources related we have to rely on our communities and, and our residents to improve forest health and reduce the wildfire risk at a local level. And, and so here you can see some pictures um, of some um, harvesting work that we're doing, removing some of the dead lodgepole pine component um, to tackle forest health and, and regenerate that forest, right? Create the space um, to, to have that forest grow back. 
Um, and our forests matter, matter to all of us. Uh, this is a unique moment for, for our forests. And, and I'm sure you're feeling that same sense of urgency that we do, that I do, um, that we are at this threshold, really. Like things are changing rapidly. We, we, everyone's talking about water. Everyone's talking about fire. And at the source of that all is our forest health conditions. And so we need to be an advocate for our forests, right? Years of persistent drought have stressed our forests, creating ideal conditions for insect outbreaks and these large destructive wildfires that Michelle was mentioning. Um, these conditions combine with more people living in areas of that interface, right? That wildland urban interface we were discussing. Um, require us to act boldly and, and to really help our communities adapt to a new normal with wildfire. Um, and so I think you know some of the reasons why you should be, why you should care about Colorado's forests and not just our Medbow forest right here where we spend a lot of our time skiing and hiking and biking. Um, we need them to continue to provide clean air and clean water the wildlife habitat for um, all our wonderful wildlife in, and also support our economies. I mean, the ski area, the tourism industry, service industry depends on, on our, the background of our forests, right? So um, we need to maintain those places that we experience the outdoors and, and we'll be able to get away get away to find peace and, and enjoyment, right? Um, our forests are a central, central to our way of life, not just to a forester, but I think to everyone in this meeting. Um, and so, yes, I know all of you in this meeting will be strong advocates for the health of our forest, lobbying with our members of Congress um, and continuing this Tremendous, tremendous challenge we have ahead of us. <clears throat> now, there is a critical connection between the quality of water and the health of the forested watersheds from which it flows, right? So most of Colorado's water sources start in the state's forest. And, um, and, and we are actively managing those landscapes to continue to providing that, that clean water. Um, and also the water for agriculture uses. And, and you know, we know, uh, in our, especially in our area, right? Route County, Moffat County, uh, the heritage of, of the ag, um, of the ag industry and the ag lifestyle of, of our open spaces is, is critical to, to our way of living. So, um, you know, forests, are our most efficient natural water filters. Um, they capture and clean pollutants before they enter water collection systems. Um, and a healthy forest will reduce the chances of a wildfire scorching the soil and creating those terrible post-fire conditions, you know, about erosion and mudslides that we have been seeing um, in adjacent neighboring landscapes um, in the last few years. 80% of Colorado residents rely on forested watersheds for clean drinking water, according to our Colorado's water plan. So again, it's all tied together, right? It's one forest, it's one world, water, fire, and, and forest health conditions are intrinsically linked. Um, this slide here shows a little bit of how weather plays a crucial role in, in, in insect and disease activity in, in Colorado's forests. So as you might um, as you might understand, you know, temperatures and precipitation levels um, as they change, the, the tree defenses also change. A tree that has tons of water uh, and can um, be full of water can really protect itself much better than a stressed tree. So, because during periods of drought, trees are unable, right, to produce enough resin to really push, push some of the beetles out. Um, 
so not only do they become more susceptible to insect and disease, but also to um, to fire. And we know, I mean, we keep talking about an ongoing drought. I mean, some people are, are just advocating that we talk about a new normal, right? The same way we're talking about a new normal with wildfire. It's not like we're on drought. It's just, this is our new condition. We're not, we just don't have the water we used to have and we probably won't have it again. Um, as you know, last year, this, this again shows uh, the percent of normal snowpack in Colorado watersheds uh, by last summer. Um, and May of 21 was a really wet month uh, for Colorado, but it really did not do enough to uh, mitigate for the amount of loss that we've had throughout our soils. Um, the western part of Colorado was much drier than the eastern part, and we continue to see that the low level of snowpack in the mountains affect us through the growing season, right? I mean, trees grow, our trees, our high elevation trees grow during the spring and summer, and if they don't have enough water during those months to, to sustain that growth, um, we're in trouble. We're in trouble, and those forests are in trouble. So. Again, we're going to continue to see a lot of stress um, in our forest, and we'll need several years of, of really adequate precipitation to, to recover some of their some of their defenses to, to, um, to withstand again these current uh, drought conditions. Um, now, you know, drought. Um, is really affecting our higher elevation forests. This shows um, some uh, spruce, fir spruce forest in the Rio Grande National Forest, but this, this could, you know, might as well be rabbit ears, right? We are seeing that drought is really threatening um, the conditions of those high elevation forests uh, by um, exacerbating the the occurrence of these insects so spruce beetle is has been tremendously active as well and they'll persist for years for years um so we need to work quicker and and complete more landscape scale projects um that can help us really tackle tackle this tremendous challenge that that we've been discussing um as forest managers we do that every day, right? Connecting the dots, working with the US Forest Service, working with the BLM, working with CPW and in, in, in our county open space to try to identify those priority areas and think of our forested uh, areas as one landscape. And how do we, how are we being the most effective in leveraging those resources to manage our landscape? Um, the picture here shows um, some of the slides that, right? We last year, last summer, remember, like I seventy closed several times because the Glenwood Canyon had some really awful mudslides as a result of the fires they experienced in that canyon. So these types of post fire effects have effects on local economies, and we need to be preemptive in these efforts to um, to try to avoid. Uh, grappling with these uh, post-fire um, post fire consequences. We've been lucky en route that we haven't had a big damaging fire yet. And, 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 that's, and that's the hope that we can get ahead of it and, and, and hopefully, um, yeah, avoid, avoid some of these tragedies uh, in terms of, again, the loss of life, the loss of infrastructure, um, and continue to reduce wildfire fuels uh, and prepare our communities for fire. Yeah, this is a little bit of, um, you know, we all saw the pictures of the Marshall Fire last December. I think it had just snowed here in Steamboat. Um, and I was so thankful looking out the window and seeing white because this was burning. Um, December 30th, outside Boulder. This could have been Steamboat over Thanksgiving, out in Steamboat 2, where I live. I mean, it's, it's, it could happen anywhere. 
and 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 we need to be we need to be you know, grapple with with the, this new reality. Um, we have to be honest to our um, with our stakeholders and our citizens as to what our wildfire risks is and what the reality of our fire season has become. Because we're having the most destructive fire in the history of Colorado on December 30th. So that is really a really, really overwhelming fact to, to grapple with. But that that is it. Costs continue to increase. And then obviously the recovery and the preparedness uh, is critical. Um, the Yampa Valley Community Foundation is taking some really good steps preparing for what this means, learning from our neighbors with United Way. They've invited, you know, the Boulder um, Valley Community Foundation and others that have grappled with these tragic and enormous disturbances so that we can learn from our neighbors and have better plans in place and be ready to respond when this happens, if it happens in our community. Know that we have many, many people working on these issues, okay? It's not just your foresters, it's your community leaders, your local governments, your NGOs. So um, get involved how you can uh, to contribute to, again, this enormous challenge we have in front of us. I discussed a little bit the spruce beetle. Here's a picture of a Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, and, you know, this is the Kawanichi Valley in, in the park, and you see all that spruce is dead. So, oof, enormous landscape issues, enormous, enormous landscape issues. We have about 2 million acres affected by spruce beetle, beetle since the 2000s. Two million acres. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to let that number resonate with you there for a little bit, because again, what's the capacity around that tremendous disturbance, right? How do we tackle that? Um, again, we must continue to, to invest in our forests. There's a big push now through the infrastructure bill and, and other sources of money to make critical investments in Colorado's forests and, and in the welfare mitigation work that we need to be doing with our residents in our communities. Um, the State Forest Service has been putting some of that money to work. Um, you know, during, we got a, several million dollars uh, allocated to some of our grant programs last year. Um, and this year, again, some of that funding will, will continue to increase. There are some new programs through DNR and some new programs at the federal level with historic investments that are being made in the forests of the West. Um, Senator Bennett has been very active in that front, developing new tools and new funding mechanisms. So again, if, if you would like to know more about those funding opportunities, and the work on the ground we're doing, please just hit me up, call me and schedule a meeting and we can discuss how we can support um, what is going on in your neighborhood better. Um, as I was saying, we got 6.4 million last year for um, one of our grant programs. This year we should be getting eight. And that program through, um, through the Furworm grant ended up uh, funding several projects here in Rout County that we're going to be implementing this summer. Uh, Rout County, we're going to be doing some work around the Mount Werner water sanitation uh, water plant uh, adjacent to the sanctuary. We're going to be doing some work uh, with the Catamoun Water District and also with Croa and the Cattlemen's Ag uh, Trust Land um, along the Steamboat Wui. So that program provides a 50% match for the work you're doing that is wildfire risk reduction and watershed health uh, related. Um, so again, more money coming in, um, slightly more capacity. So we again need to be leveraging these funds creatively. Another exciting thing that's happening and that some of you might be aware is that there is support through a house bill um, to reinvigorate our nursery. Um, you know, the, the state 
forest service nursery, as Michelle was saying, has been growing baby trees for the retreat program here with some native Yampa stock. Um, but it also grows trees for a lot of other communities and, and has been playing a critical role in providing plant material for after fire uh, restoration work in, in many, many different communities. So if you, um, if you can, Again, support the cause, support the nursery, buy trees from the nursery, and um, and yeah, and plant trees, right? That's the best thing you can do. It's plant a tree. <laughs> this, this spring, summer, hopefully you already have plans to plant a tree or two or volunteer with Retree in October. Last but not least, um, we want to talk a little bit about our upcoming Route County Wildfire Mitigation Conference. We're planning for a resilient future. Um, this is a presented by the County Wildfire Mitigation Council, and there's a really strong steering committee behind it, bringing all the stakeholders um, together on Friday. And then on Saturday, we're gonna have our public conference to hopefully um, sorry, hopefully bring um, some really relevant information to the public. Um, we hope that attendees will be able to create a, a personal and a home readiness plan, or at least the beginnings of it, so that they can go home and start having these conversations with their families and their neighbors and get us all readier for this upcoming wildfire, wildfire season. Um, the 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 website to register is routewildfire.org, and we hope to see many of you um, at this wonderful event in late April to kick off uh, Wildfire Awareness Month, which is May every year. Uh, kick that off in full form and be as ready as we can. Um, you know, individual responsibility and community responsibility. We all need to be on the same page discussing these issues together. Um, yeah, and with that, I am going to open it up to questions and comments. Thank you so much. Great. Carolina, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. And uh, it is such a pleasure to have you. Again, a very timely topic. So um, as I mentioned, I just have a few um, individuals who um, I have teed up to provide comments. Um, whether they are just kind of updates that are relevant uh, to our discussion on forest health, intersections between the forests and our watershed. Um, so I just have a few of them. And so really this is an open floor Q&A. So again, you are welcome to post questions to the chat um, or you're welcome to raise your hand um, after we move into the Q&A section, but see this as a great opportunity, a chance to ask Carolina questions, who is a wealth of knowledge as I'm sure you heard. Um, so first up, I would, it is my pleasure to welcome Councillor West, um, who is going to speak on behalf, just provide a few updates um, relative to the Wildfire Mitigation Council, and then also um, had some updates on the recent Council discussion on water conservation. So again, at those intersections between forest health and water. So Councillor West, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, and hi all. Um, Carolina has covered the real key to what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it anyway because it's twice as important as everything else. Uh, Route County Wildfire Mitigation Council, um, I am on that representing the city. There are a number of community members and officials who have gotten this organization on its feet. Um, it is still, uh, it is still in, in the baby stages, but it's remarkable what has happened already. Uh, if, any, if anybody knows of uh, a potential executive director candidate who's got wildland fire experience, uh, by all means uh, contact us because that is still a project. In the meantime, um, projects large and small have gotten underway. Um, there is a risk mitigation presentation that has been put together that is already available. And the object here is to make it available to homeowners associations 
any kind of group like that that might be able to inform their members and also think about what that HOA can do in terms of mitigation. Um, other mitigation projects continue. Carolina has, has really gone through all of those. Probably the most important thing that's going on right now is that we do need to update the Community Wildlife Protection Plan. And I saw a question flash in the chat on that. It was last updated in 2010. Obviously it needs updating again. Um, and the city is among many that, who are contributing to, uh, to that happening. They need to hire, they will hire a consultant firm that will get that going uh, kind of as soon as possible. And you've already had the pitch about the importance of the Route County Wildfire Mitigation Conference. Um, I urge everybody to go to the Saturday um, presentations. It's open to the public, it's at CMC. Um, I don't believe you need any kind of a ticket for that, Carolina, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, everyone who goes there will, 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 the object there is that everyone will leave with a mitigation plan for that, that, that they can implement in their own home. Um, when we lived up in North Route and we were on the fire department up there, we, my husband and I, um, in 2012, which was also a, a terrible drought year. We parked our vehicles facing out. We had go bags at the door. We had dog crates at the fire station and we lived in fear, but we were living in the middle of the forest. We don't think that can happen in a city like Steamboat, but this past year has proven us to be absolutely wrong. We don't want it to happen here. We do everything we can to prevent it from happening here. But boy, if it does happen here, we want all of our citizens to be prepared to know what to do and to be able to execute on a plan. That's my pitch on that. Um, water conservation. We had a, a great presentation, we on council last night about uh, what the city is doing and thinking about in terms of water conservation. Um, a lot of discussion about infrastructure maintenance and improvements um, and to integrate water conservation with land use planning is one goal. Um, to integrate the water conservation plans into the Steamboat Springs area community plan, to uh, update landscaping standards in the development codes and to provide a low water use model landscape plan that others can adapt. That's, that's it for now, thanks. Great, thank you so much. Next, we have Scott Kalman, who is Route County Director of Environmental Health. Uh, thanks and hello everyone. <clears throat> and I don't have too much. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that we are, um, Again, resuming with our annual cleanup day. So it's just save the date at this point, uh, May 21st. Uh, more details are forthcoming, but we're working with uh, Main Street Steamboat to try to coordinate with them a little bit, kind of streamline the sign up process. Um, so we're excited to get that moving again after a couple of years off because of COVID. Um, and I guess just really quick with the climate action plan, um, the, as everyone probably knows, the collaborative board has formed and uh, the focus right now is on building capacity and that continues. Um, I think we have our sixth meeting here at the uh, end of April, um, looking at proposals for management entities, a few other things, but um, that keeps progressing. Um, and I guess that's about all I had, thank you. And thanks, Caroline, I have a question for you when that comes up. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Scott. Okay, next we have Sally Ross, who is the Wildland Program Director for Oak Creek Fire Protection District. Welcome, Sally. Hey, thanks, um, Michelle, who you are, who are you? Um, so we are working in South Route County with uh, landowners to implement mitigation project work. 
um, and help promote some of these things that Carolina was talking to um, about home site assessments and um, wildfire preparedness in HOA and among um, other neighborhoods and community members. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is duplicate Carolina throughout the county um, and pull from her expertise to help guide the work that we're implementing to um, reach the targets for that initial emergency preparedness stage for homeowners, but also work towards these longer term forest health goals on private lands and um, hopefully in conjunction with some of the um, federal lands to the US Forest Service lands that border these private lands. Um, and we want to work amongst all landowners that includes livestock owners, active ranchers, um, recreators, and um, again, broader HOAs throughout the area. Great, thank you so much, Sally. Okay, next we have Nathan Stewart, who is professor at sustain of sustainability studies at Colorado Mountain College. And I think we have the pleasure also of having a cohort of Rocky Mountain land management interns today with us. So welcome, and it's really wonderful to have you part of the discussion. Um, so welcoming you, Nathan. Excellent. Thanks, Michelle, for the opportunity to say hello. Carolina, thank you for your talk as well. I'm looking forward to this q and I have a question I'll post to you um, as well, too. It's great to be here with community partners. Uh, my announcement is actually really quick, and it does focus on this group that's with us here today. Um, many partners know, I'll use the chat to share a little bit here, know about the um, nationally unique internship um, program that we have with the US Forest Service. Six of those students here, as you're looking around your Zoom screen, Chelsea, Onyx, Lucy, Will, Kayla, and Rachel are in their first year in that program. Um, and we'll embark on a first summer in partnership with our forests this summer. So cumulatively, this is a neat moment to recognize what they will accomplish over the arc of the program. More than, more than 7,000 hours of service to Medbo Route, White River, and Pike San Isabel. So it's sort of a powerful model here looking at the individuals um, that are here with us. Um, some of them are enrolled in a new, this is my second and final announcement, program here at the college that a number on the call have contributed to in significant ways. I'm looking at Scott and Tim, um, who looked at this curriculum with us in great detail. Um, Nicole Pepper's faculty teaching in this program as it launches in the fall. So I wanted to share this with you. Um, this is for new students, but also for those looking to retool for positions um, in the agency in the Forest Service or elsewhere in, in ecosystem science, ecological restoration, GIS. So I include some of those new course offerings here um, that'll launch in the fall. So thanks for the opportunity to join and looking forward to the Q&A. Great, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining. It's really a pleasure to have you. I'm sure you saw all the smiles, but it is so encouraging and exciting to have such a lively uh, and very promising cohort rising to service um, in this very important sector. So thank you for joining and you're wholeheartedly invited to continue joining these. Um, and last but not least, I think our only TEDA partner update um, is Todd Hagenboo, who is going to connect grasshoppers with fire mitigation and forest health and watersheds in our last teed up comment and then we'll transition to Q&A. So um, again, get ready to post questions in the chat or raise your hand and Todd, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Boy, Michelle, you set me up for failure there. I don't know if I can tie all of that together, but I will say as we talk about climate change, we talk about how things are changing, including the health of our forests and what bugs we consider endemic, not endemic, pandemic, whatever. Um, grasshoppers have been one of those major things. So I'm sharing my screen real quick here to share with you all. You can see that we are hosting a community-wide grasshopper workshop and meeting next Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. in the commissioner's hearing room. Melissa Schreiner, who is a new entomologist with CSU, passionate about the subject and working with us on the West Slope um, to combat this and any number of insect issues that Carolina and I work together on um, will be joining us. Would love if you have community members who are interested in helping us deal with this issue, have you join us next Wednesday at seven o'clock. Thanks, Michelle. We'll turn it over and back to uh, the incomparable Ms. Manriquez. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I know that we had some questions come up. I believe one question was about the conference. Uh, do people need to register? So Carolina, that might be one to get you going. Talk a little bit more about um, how people can come to that. Everyone is encouraged to come. And then we can start moving into those questions that have been teed up by um, a few participants already. 
Yes. So yes, people do need to register because um, we only have space for so many. So um, go to the website. There's a link right there on the homepage and register. And if you cannot make it for whatever reason, we'll have information posted on the website. So keep going back to the website, wildfire.org, because we're hoping that that will be the hub for connecting our citizens to all the information they need wildfire related. So who, how to contact the council, how to get help with issues they might have, what resources are available, what funding might be available, how to do this, right? So uh, keep going back to the website and we hope to see you at the end of April. Great. Okay, so um, we can, you can raise hands in the, you know, the little reaction button that's in our screens, but I know Scott Kalman, you said you had a question. Um, Nathan, you said you had a question. I don't know if there's any additional comments uh, related to the CWPP clarifications that we'd like to add there. Carolina, I know you've had a lot of, um, you know, involvement in past uh, wildfire protection plans. So any initial comments there and then. So it, it's exciting. It's an exciting time for us, for, 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 for our county um, and for bringing our stakeholders together to, to again, tackle the, this tremendous issue that we have with our forest health conditions in, in reducing our wildfire risk. So the CWPP has been identified as one of the key steps in redefining our priorities on our, you know, throughout our landscape so that we can do this work in, again, synergy, leverage limited resources, get the funding we need to be very strategic. So the community wildfire protection plan we have for route dates back to 2010. There's a lot we have done since then, but obviously it's supposed to be a living document and it needs to be updated. We went out, the council and the county OEM developed an RFP. Um, we developed some goals and objectives for this, for this document and we went out and we did not get the proposals we were hoping to get because the first word in community wildfire protection plan is community. This has to be a community driven process where the community identifies values at risk so that we can get the buy-in and we can get the responsibility and stewardship around this to implement this plan. So we were missing that critical community engagement piece in these first couple of proposals. So the council is gathering more funds and then coming back out in a few weeks with a second round, a, the second round of the, the renewed RFP. And we're hoping, ah, hoping to have someone in place at some point this summer. It should take about a year, maybe a year and a half, hopefully just a year to get us again, redefining our priorities um, and aligning those priorities. Because my priorities might not be your priorities. So we need to find where those priorities align and be very strategic. So it's exciting, it's happening. You'll hear about engagement opportunities hopefully happening throughout the county. And we need you to spread the word, to get your neighbors to attend meetings and for you to attend them as well. This is a, the key part of this process is that engagement. Great, so I'm going to turn to the chat. We've had some great questions come in. Um, the first being from Will Klaus. Uh, when will the FRWRM resume accepting applications and can it be leveraged on federally managed lands and critical watersheds adjacent to private lands that affect the public water supply? That's a really good question, Will. And yes, this is the first year that we'll be able to use furworm grants to treat adjacent federal lands. Um, so the, the right now, if you go to our website, csfs.colostate.edu, you'll still see the materials for the previous round of applications, but you can start working based on those templates on what your project might be. The official opening for the next round will be August, 2022. Um, but as I said, the documents and the requirements won't change much. You probably need a 50% match and you need to be talking to us 
so that we can help you streamline your application and get the, the right uh, language in there to make it uh, come up in the ranking of, of, of all these applications we get every year. So yes, it will be, you'll be able to leverage federal lands. And more importantly, this year, the Furlong Grant also will fund capacity, which is one of the critical things we need. So we're hoping the council, the wildfire council, will be able to tap into some of those funds to leverage existing funds to get us NED and potentially other staffing that are critically, critically needed. Great. Okay, next question is from Sarah Lochran. What are the barriers to accelerating landscape scale forest restoration and protection? Uh, assuming that money is one barrier, but what are the others? That is a really good question, Sarah. And there are many barriers and there are many opportunities. I mean, some of the barriers are just the sheer scale of the issue. I mean, I just talked about 2 million acres affected by the spruce beetle. Add to that the 2 million acres that were affected by the lodgepole beetle, I mean, by the mountain pine beetle. I mean, we're talking about millions of acres on our landscape that need treatment, right? And so tied to the scale of the issue is the capacity to, to deal with the issue from planning to implementation. So planning includes NEPA, right? Like we need our US Forest Service to and our BLM to get ahead of the planning process and identify the strategic areas we need to be treating in a much quicker window. There are some new tools to do that. And instead of taking four to five years, it's taking a year, maybe two, depending on how big of an area we're trying to address. Um, so planning is an issue and, and, and industry and service capacity. So who are the people doing the work? Right? Are we selling this timber? Are we servicing this timber? Um, how, what, where's that capacity to do the actual work? Our industry in Colorado is very small. Um, it got hit really hard by the recession in, uh, in 09 and 2010. It's rebuilding, but, um, but the issues and the barriers are many. Um, we're getting a lot of money put into the issue, but as you're saying, money doesn't solve some of these barriers. We need you to be advocating for your land with the U.S. Forest Service. Contact your district ranger. Contact us. L write letters of support. Um, and also um, buy local wood. You know, we have several local mills. There's a mill in Partial. There's a mill, um, you know, down here in Granby, several mills. We have a mill in Craig. So if you can make a choice to buy local wood, buy local wood, support your local industry. Um, we have a list of contractors out of our office that do different kinds of things. So again, if you need more information about what our local capacity might be, reach out um, and let us know. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Susie Ramig. Could you please speak to more about who should attend um, this year's conference and are there things on Friday or um, it says should attend on Friday for this year's conference. So a little bit more information about the conference solicitation for who should who should come. Okay, so Friday is what we're calling our stakeholder meeting, and that's by invitation. Uh, we've invited local governments, federal, state, local agencies, NGOs, private business, et cetera. It's a group of about 50 to 60 different stakeholders that uh, will come together to, again, move us forward in the conversation, find synergies, and, and again, start discussing in more it, it, the initial initial aspects of how we're going to implement um, our CWPP uh, development. Um, so Friday, if you didn't get an invite and you still want to attend because you're a reporter, Susie, let me know. But otherwise, your day is Saturday and it's going to be a wonderful day. We've um, we are engaged uh, with some really good facilitators to help us 
think about how we get our homes readier. What action is it that we can take now? There's a lot we can do right now um, around our homes, around our neighborhoods that doesn't require a ton more funding or a ton more capacity or a lot more planning. There's a lot you can do right now. So that's what we're trying to do is empower our community, give a reality check to our community again of how lucky we've been, prepare for the next upcoming fire season and, um, and leave with some tools, leave with some tools so that people can, again, take action, take action now. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. This question from Nathan Stewart, does Furworm project support also support cross boundary GNA type forest mitigation initiatives, thinking specifically about support for low tech efforts linking forest ecosystems to water? Not just high tech or high cost methods such as mastication or other. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So what would be a low tech effort, Nate? Well, you know, Brad, you'd all teed us up to think a little bit more about Beaver Dam, maybe Beaver Dam analogs. I think some of the work that like some of the partners on the call are involved in up in California Park that has us mm -hmm. you know, using mm -hmm. the method more broadly, that that category, Carolina. That's interesting. I mean, it's it's a matter of, again, um, engaging with the process, Nate. So I don't think that's come up to light, but if we can tie if we can tie wildfire risk reduction with increased water retention in certain areas or develop the, uh, the, the, the monitoring that it will require to support it, I think we need to be proactive in, in you know, apply for funds that are outside the box. Usually in the past, the Furworm Grant has supported straightforward vegetation treatments, how many acres, what did you get, how was that used, um, but we need to, we need to get outside our box of usual things, so I would, I would work with you on trying to get creative, and, and here the important thing would be that scientific justification of how this would work, and, and we could, you know, we could do something. I, can I just jump in quickly so we don't oversell this, Brad Udall and others have said that this is potentially a strategy. It needs more research. I mean, the, the National Park Service, particularly Rocky Mountain National Park, are starting a research program um, and other places. So it, it's logical that increasing water on the landscape would help with fire mitigation, but how and where to do that is still really untested. So this is a great research project that we can maybe start here, but I don't know if I wanna start saying, we'll put mitigation dollars to it until that work's been done. But interesting. Um, I'd love to have more conversations about that. Yeah. Can I say something too? In Cattlemen's, we discussed this with all the infrastructure infrastructure upgrade needs with um, ranchers, and you know, understanding that flood irrigation has a lot of habitat benefit as well as um, ground hydrology benefits in floodplain areas, and the challenges for independent landowners and ranchers to come up with the funding to upgrade that infrastructure, you know, starting to talk to NRCS about how can we roll over some of this mitigation funding for fire coming down the pipeline to use to upgrade that infrastructure for those purposes as well as having some kind of uh, more resilient area for preparedness and buffering for communities. So it's a really neat way to potentially utilize that funding. Great. And I will pose our last question by Scott Kalman. How do you balance wildfire mitigation and soil health, knowing that you need to remove woody debris to help mitigate wildland fire, but need to retain woody debris to help support soil health and other qualities such as water retention, nutri nutrients, and microclimate? Great question to close with. So Carolina, um, your response, and then I'll close it. Oh my gosh, if we if I could answer that question, it's I would be small here. question to end with. <laughs> yeah. It's a great question. That is a tremendous question, Scott. And obviously, I, it, it revolves around matters of scale, right? I mean, if you're talking about a little watershed, you can be more um, more assertive about where you think a particular log should be left to prevent erosion, but we're dealing with huge landscape issues. I mean, you know, it's all about perspective and, and again, the potential impact. Some people look at the two, three fires we had last year, right? We had 
fires in North Route, Elk Mountain, and South Route. They didn't amount to more than 15,000 acres. And some people were calling like, oh my gosh, it's terrible. It's devastation. And I'm thinking, this is wonderful. We're creating pods for the future. We're restoring, we're regenerating areas of our forest. And so... Is it 5,000 acre fires or is it 8,000 acre fires? Is it on the headwaters or the low waters? I mean, that's that's a great question, Scott. And that's a question we should be posing at our stakeholder meeting. I definitely do not have that answer, um, um, but it's how we need to be thinking. We need to be thinking how everything has an impact on everything else. You do not manage for one thing. We manage for several things. We think we're managing for welfare risk reduction, but we're also managing for habitat. We're managing for water. It's all integrated, right? And we need to be thinking about the integration of these systems and the codependencies of these systems. And so here we have students, right? That are in this internship program and they're doing the latest science with the latest modeling with Nicole and the latest technologies and GIS and all this stuff. And so maybe they'll be able to answer these questions, hopefully have better answers than we do here in the next few years, because these issues are urgent, urgent and critical on how we identify, right, those priorities at the landscape level. So um, with that, it's 201, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for the invite. And I am so lucky to be part of this community and have you all be so engaged with these critical issues. And Carolina, thank you. You're always such an inspiring, eloquent, and very insightful and experienced spokeswoman for these issues. And we are so honored to have you working with us alongside in the Valley. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your participation and for joining. And we look forward to continued conversations. Have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Hope to see you all at the end of April. Thank you.